You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! I'd like to tell you about a little something called Creation Music Company. Creation Music Company is sponsoring the show today, and personally, I'd like to talk about their amplifiers. Why? Because I've played them several times, and I don't think they get the credit they deserve. They have some incredible amps on the market. Uh, my... My personal favorite being the Milano 50, at least out of the ones I played and experienced. Great pedal platform amp. They're amazing looking. I mean, if you just hit up the Google machine and and look at Creation Music Company's amplifiers, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Those things are gorgeous. They sound fantastic. They're very rich and all made there in-house there in Oklahoma. And yeah, I just love them. I think they're fantastic amps, and they don't get talked about enough, so I'm talking about them now because... Why the heck wouldn't I? They make a lot of other stuff too. They make pedal boards, all kinds of different accessories that you might need for your musical journey. So go to creationmusiccompany.com and check them out. But do try to listen to some of those those amplifier clips because they're awesome and I think you'll like them. You'll really enjoy what they have cooking over there. So check out creationmusiccompany.com. I'd also like to talk to you about Sinusoid because why wouldn't I want to talk about Sinusoid? Those boys from the great state of Washington, or Oregon's hat as I like to refer to it, are making some of the best cables on the market. And I want to talk to you about their TechFlex. TechFlex is a material that goes over instrument cables. It's sort of a plasticky mesh feeling stuff. It's available in a wide variety of colors. Of course, they just got two new colors in yesterday. One is like totally like this yellow and pink 80s twisted masterpiece, which I think is just awesome. And then this, there's this other like really deep pink and purple. And it's crazy what these cables do when you put the, the different colored tech flex over the different color like core cables. Uh, it looks insane and it protects things. It slides around nice on stage. And it's a, it just is a nice way to you know set your cables apart from everybody else's. And everyone else has got the black cables. Everything gets all tangled up and messed up and goes into your drummer's van somehow. And you're like, what are you doing with my guitar cable? Never fear, with Sinusoid, you can make a custom cable right on their website that will be specific to you, and you'll know it's yours every time, so you can say, Martin, put down my cable. You're a bass player. You can't have my cable. Or something like that. I don't know if his name's Martin. I don't know why. No offense to any Martins out there. I'm sure you're great people. But go to Sinusoid.com and check out their custom cable builder and build the cable of your dreams. I also want to tell you about Gun Street Wiring Shop. Gun Street Wiring Shop out of Bend, Oregon. They've been with us for quite a while now supporting the show, and I have to say, the more that I work with Sean, the more impressed I am with his operation over there. I see all the time these new wiring harness jobs he's coming up with for custom applications where people are wanting to get nuts and get crazy, and he always figures out a solution to whatever the problem might be. And, you know, maybe your tastes run more traditional. Maybe you want to do old school 50s style wiring. You want a treble bleed circuit, something a little more simple. That's all on the website. That's all there, all ready to go. But for anybody who's like me and needs to get a little bit strange to have their their life fulfilled, you go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and connect them, If you or connect with them, rather. Shoot them an email, and they will get you sorted for all of your guitar wiring needs. Go to GunStreetWiringShop.com. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to talk to you about a way you can support the show without doing anything other than feeding your gear desires. I know, I know you have them. You're listening to this show. You're a gear nerd, just like the rest of us. Don't try to pretend otherwise. But if you go to tonemob.com slash reverb, that will redirect you to reverb.com through a special link. And anything you purchase through that link comes back to help support the show. So it's just tonemob.com slash reverb. Type it in your browser. It will take you right to the, re- re- the, 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 
the reverb.com that you know and love. And you can do all your normal shopping. You can do your buying, selling, trading, whatever you're going to do on there. Even just simply signing up for a new account. So if this is the first time you're hearing about Reverb and you've been curious about it, you go through that link, sign up for a new account. That's going to help put some wind in the sails. So anything you do through Reverb.com, whether it's buying or selling, if you use that link, it will help us out a lot. A little percentage of that sale will come back to help support the show. doesn't cost you anything extra. It's all the same on your end. You just got to go through ToneMob.com slash Reverb, and that helps keep some wind in the sails of this weird little nerdy pirate chip thing that we have going on. So anyway, ToneMob.com slash Reverb for all of that. Okay, sorry to do this to you again. I know, I know, I know. More house cleaning. But you need to know, because I have to apologize for two things. One, sorry this is a day late, because I got very, very sick the night slash morning that this was uh, supposed to be released, and I could not physically sit there and edit this up. So apologies for that, but it's up now, and that's what counts. And also, this is the other episode I talked about back on the Adrian Thorpe episode, where... The audio was weird because the mic was recording from the mic behind my head and not the one in front of my face, and nobody could tell because internet stuff, and I won't get into all the technical details. All that to say is my audio is really weird again this week. Just mine. Colt sounds magnificent, Um, uh, but I think the conversation is good enough that that should carry it, and, and hopefully it's not too bad. And I'm taking some measures to ensure that, at least on my side, that shouldn't happen again. Of course, you know, anything could happen. Things are crazy. But the goal is for this to never be the case again. But, uh, you know, fingers crossed and all that, of course. But I'll stop talking on this section and get right into it. Just so you know, it's going to sound, my voice is going to sound a little weird. Colt's going to sound magnificent. But I think the conversation is great regardless. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Okay, bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Tone Mob podcast. This time I'm here with... Mr. Colt Westbrook from Walrus Audio. What is happening? Nothing. I am. What is happening? Man, I'm just, I'm chilling here in the shop and uh, I have uh, plans today to record a podcast for Tone Mob and that's kind of it. Oh man. Well, thank you for taking the time, setting it aside and we finally, we're finally doing it. How long has it been that we've been supposed to do this? And then I think like 60 or 70 years. It's been on the table for a really long time. So, yeah, it's good to, after all these decades to finally sit down and get to do this with you, man. I wish, really, really, really wish you hadn't just revealed to however many people that we are both vampires. Yeah, we're, we're this, no. and the, the, this podcast has been around for decades. And I remember you know, years and years ago. You know, here in the first couple runs, I mean, it's come a long way. So congratulations to you, man. Oh, well, thanks. Like, same yeah. could be said about yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100-year-old pedal company. I said, <laughs> back yeah. before, you know, yeah, it's, it's a... Well, what a lot of people don't know about us vampires, we're very passionate about two things. One of those is uh, blood, which is pretty common knowledge. Absolutely. Another one... Yeah. Oh, yes. All types. I'm not really picky uh, on on what type it is, but also uh, square waves and fuzz pedals are a very important thing. Man, it, that is the truth. That kind of sums up my two passions right there. Blood and Man, fuzz. We, exactly. Exactly. Fantastic. I haven't talked about vampires in hours, so this is crazy. Are you a sparkly vampire? Uh. It de- it depends. Honestly, I don't know a lot about vampires. I I know that my I have a little brother, and he was really into the Twilight stuff. Uh, but I had it, I had kind of missed the boat, and so um, I saw one of them. I think in college, like the movies, and uh, it was really bad. Okay. So <laughs> okay. yeah, <laughs> I, All right. I just I didn't see any more. Yeah. I you're yeah. you're one up on me. I just I just. I heard that there was vampires that sparkle, and I said, "That's not my vampire. My vampire is like out of Thirty Days of Night." Yeah, you know, I kind of remember that. That's my vampire. I think like uh, whatever that guy's name was. I think he glittered like a little bit, 
you know, like if the sun kind of came out through the clouds, he had like this glittery thing. And yeah, I mean, I, I mean just this conversation right here proves that it's kind of weird. And, but it, I mean, and I don't want to offend anybody listening that's really into the vampire stuff. I mean, to each his own. And you're welcome to that freedom and entitled to walk in that passion, but uh, just not into <laughs> vampires at all. You know, I, I, I really appreciate your openness and your, your willingness to allow people to pursue their undead uh, passions. I just think you've that's got, really awesome. Yeah. You've got the green light from me. Absolutely. And what more could you possibly need? Yeah, not much. I, well, I don't know. Depends on who you ask. So, yeah. so, Let's get into some stuff and some things. Let's do it. I would like to know something. Actually, I'd like to know lots of things. And um, the the primary question would be kind of the classic kick off the podcast question, which is, you know, what's your musical backstory and how did you get to be where you are today? Um, uh, I drove here today, and um, that is a <laughs> short story. <laughs> Um, my musical background, uh, no, I started, I started playing guitar and when I was a teenager, like 11 years old, I guess that's not teenager, but, um, when you're 11, you call it a teenager, right? Uh, and no, I grew up in, uh, I was a pastor's kid in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and, um, I wanted to play guitar really badly. And, uh, so one summer, when I was visiting family up in Minnesota, up in St. Paul, uh, my uncle took me to a guitar shop and bought me a my first acoustic guitar when I was 11. And uh, yeah, taught me how to play a couple songs that two weeks when I was up there. And then when I came back uh, at my church, the music minister was actually like an incredible guitar player. And so he... Uh, offered lessons every week. Like he, we did one hour of jazz lessons and then one hour of, of what he called jam lessons, which is like group lessons where we all kind of jam and riff off each other. And I did that for a, like f- several years. And it was just really uh, a crazy opportunity in a small town to have uh, just like an open door like that to learn guitar. Um, and uh, yeah. And so, you know, I played in bands and in high school, I was in a band in high school called the Colt Westbrook band. And, uh, I named it that, uh, because, um, why not? (laughs) Cause Dave Matthews was so hot then. And, uh, and I was like, well, if Dave can get away with it, like, why can't I? Um, and so I was in the Colt Westbrook band and we were really, really bad. Um, and, uh, I remember, one time we were playing this show in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and um, I had invited uh, everybody in high school to come to this show. And it was $5 to get in. And we were only opening for the real band that was coming, the headlining band. And it was Dave $5 Matthews, to get in. Da- yeah, exactly. Totally Dave Matthews. I honestly don't even remember what band it was, but I remember they brought their own lights. And I thought, like, one day I'm going to bring my own lights. Uh, and so, but, uh, so everybody paid $5 to get in and, uh, which was, a, which was a lot of money back in 2002. It and, was, uh, it really in, was in, t- dating back to inflation. I mean, it's probably like six fifty now. Uh, so, and I remember there were a lot of people showed up, you know, and I was really nervous because man, everybody showed up. And we only have four songs. And so, and one of them's not even full band. It's just me on acoustic because the band hadn't even learned it yet. And, uh, and so, man, we plowed through those four songs in about maybe like 16, 17 minutes. And they were like, thanks for coming out tonight. Stick around for the band. And everybody, like the crowd did an applause. It was more of like, are those the only songs you're playing? And then I was like, yeah, that's like all we got. And they're like, play more songs, play more songs. And I was like, we don't have any more songs. <laughs> and uh, and that was that was the end of the Colt Westbrook band. That was the last gig we played. And so, yeah, man. And then in college, uh, playing some other bands, uh, 
And uh, yeah, probably the, the most recent project after school was called Mopac and it's on uh, Spotify and uh, we get, I mean, tens and tens of monthly listeners. So you can check it out there and turn that 19 into a 20. Tens, um, tens. That sounds tens like. and tens. Yeah. That's a yeah, like crazy. Yeah. Same anyway, thing. so that's kind of the, uh, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of exciting stories, you know, kind of in that, in that time frame that I just gave you, but really gear and pedals and walrus didn't really happen until 2014. Um, and so, uh, so walrus started in 2011, uh, with a guy named Brady Smith and he actually runs old blood noise endeavors now. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know exactly who that is like old blood noise. I have to explain to some people like who walrus is and what guitar pedals are, you know, my family is always like, so what do they do? Uh, oh, man. But, <laughs> I know that. Um, I know that feeling. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I have to re-explain it to my mom. Like every time, you know, I have to show her one. Um, but Brady started walrus, uh, with an initial investor in 2011 and, uh, and then in 2014, Brady spun off to start Old Blood Noise Endeavors. And then in 2014, I came on just like a couple weeks uh, after Brady went to go start Old Blood Noise. Um, and uh, yeah, I knew the investor and uh, we had a relationship before that. And man, I was working a corporate job uh, here in town at an energy company and running a running a pedal business sounded way more awesome. And so it was a fantastic opportunity. And then just a couple months after that, I brought on a guy named Jason Stulse, who is an engineer I've been friends with since college. Um, long time ago, he used to build amps and, uh, I used to bum gear off him back in the day when we were playing more music. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, so I brought on Jason to be the chief product developer pretty much. Uh, and, um, I tried my hand at it and that is what the Vanguard dual phase is. And if you notice, it's not in production anymore. And so I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get another guy in here that is way better at this than I am. And so, so for Walrus, I handle tons of the marketing and distribution sales and, uh, day to day things like that, um, fulfillment and logistics. And, and then Jason handles a lot of the heavy lifting on the development side and, and products and, uh, things like that. So, so yeah, man, that's the, that's the short story on kind of walrus audio and, and, uh, yeah, I didn't leave anything out. Nothing. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's all. it, dude. Thanks wow. for having me on. All right. I guess this is good enough. So, um, <laughs> you know, I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. everybody see you later. Yeah, so so that's what we do, man. That's that's where we are. It's where we're from. So it seems Walrus is really interesting in in its you know I don't know what how I should say this. It's basically like you know like Keeley Electronics, like everyone knows, it's Robert Keeley, right? Yeah, and and then uh, you know same with like Wampler and lots of the other guys is guys have their their names on it, and even Old Blood Noise to to a degree. Like Brady's always been the guy you know uh-huh. um and and it seems like uh, walrus is kind of interesting because like while you are the guy uh, as far as public perception goes i i think a lot of people don't realize the story that you just told that you came on kind of later i think a lot of people think that you started it right a lot of people do and uh i will not miss a chance to really honor brady and seth mccarroll and uh and all the guys that really helped pull Walrus uh, from the ground up uh, and really gave us like a fantastic starting point uh, from where we're at. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was, it was already a thing and they already had products like the Voyager, the Iron Horse, the Jupiter, Deep Six, uh, wa- like before we got here. And so, um, and then everything from then on, uh, from 2014 on, was was kind of me and Jason's, uh, yeah, me and Jason's ideas and products and dreams and 
and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, a lot of pedal companies, um, you know, are, it's weird to not have like the, the product developer kind of at the top of the, at the company, like Keely is, yeah, like you mentioned Keely and Josh Scott, um, Brian Wampler and, you know, Earthquaker Devices, all those guys, you know, kind of have the chief product developers also kind of at the, at the top of the company. And, but that's, I mean, that's just really how Walrus is run. I mean, you know, Jason doesn't necessarily like report to me. I mean, it's more of like a team effort, um, where we're kind of, we are working in tandem and submitting really to each other, uh, to, for the future and in the day-to-day of the company. And so, um, but I, I probably talk more and, uh, and do a lot more marketing. And, and so that's probably why you see my face a little bit more. Well, and you got really good hair. Let's be man. Honest. I got a haircut for this podcast though. You did? If so, you don't I have did. the glorious, the glorious mane. No, I don't. I don't. I cut it off. Do you like it? Uh, well, uh, no, it's a, it's a dry question cause you can't see it. Uh, I, no, I no, I, but probably I don't get, like, like it. I probably get, that's okay. I, I respect your honesty, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to proceed with what I believe is right. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I probably get like one haircut every year or year and a half. And I just kind of go through that cycle and I have been I stuck. Would... In, oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying I've been, I've been stuck in that cycle for, uh, probably since high school. You know, just growing it out, cutting it, growing it out, cutting it. And, you know, I just really can't stick to something. I'm like always in the in-between phase. So, yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I would do that too. I'm, uh, I'm kind of a, a thing where it's like as soon as I have to start doing something with the hair, it's time for it to go. Like, like it's like, oh, I kind of got to like comb it or something. Time to cut it all off. You know, I told exactly. my wife it's either going to be real long or gone. Like there's not going to be an in between with me, so it's so just been you, gone. Do you, so do you like uh, do you razor it? Is that what you do? Like like a like a trimmer, like a trimmer, or do you go somewhere? Uh, I I go somewhere. Uh, I don't I don't I I would do it myself, but basically I keep it just I, I keep it just a touch longer than what I would do if I was going to do it myself. Uh, you know, yeah. If I'm going to do it myself, I just I just take a number one and just cut the whole thing off. But my yeah. wife doesn't really like that. So it's a little bit of an in-between where I have a number one on the sides and a number two on the top. And so yeah. I have to, I can't do that myself. I need somebody no. to do that. You got to, you got to, you got to hook up with somebody you trust. Where do you go? Where do you live? I live in, uh, in, well, just outside of Portland. So. Gotcha. Where, where, where are you? you Oregon know, City. Tiger. Okay. Oregon City. Yeah. Are you familiar so, with the area? I am. Yeah. I used to, my best friend and. Uh, his family used to live in Portland, and so we'd go up there a lot uh, to visit them because it's a great place to visit. So, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I usually just say Portland because nobody knows where Oregon City is. I get it. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you got a nice place up there. Keep it going. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll do our best. Yeah, cool. I was gonna say, e- even though everyone tried to get to Oregon City back in the '90s when they were playing the Oregon Trail game on their green screen Macintosh computers, but nobody remembers that. But yeah. Oregon city is the end of the Oregon trail, man. You are, you are, uh, you are etched in stone in a lot of people's upbringings with being part of the Oregon trail. Yeah. A lot of people That's died of dysentery trying to get to get to here, man. Lots. I think we should just have a moment of silence for those people. All right, let's do it. Man, that was great. That was great. I needed really that. Good. Thank you for that. That was great podcasting. Everyone. I needed that. Everyone wants that. Yeah. You're so probably tell me a little that bit. Out. I'm probably not. <laughs> let's let's get go a little bit of different direction. Tell me tell me more about Colt. We know Colt as it pertains to Walrus, and uh, you know, we see it in the videos. We see you doing the stuff. We see it, Nam sitting at the chair, you know, sitting at the the table, talking to people, looking all, you know, casual and relaxed and doing the thing. But what we, we don't really know Colt himself. Like what, what kind of bands are you into? What do you, what do you do? What do you, what do you do when you're not walrusing? 
what do I do when I'm not walrusing? Uh, and what kind of bands am I into? Um, man, I, uh, I think maybe like the top five of life, you know, like if, if you're in music, like that's like the worst question possible because it, you know, like you're into, you kind of are into everything, you know, but I think really the top five bands of life. And I don't think through this very often. So I'm going to leave some key people out, but you know, I think Tom Petty is probably number one, uh, with, uh, uh, I'm thinking of, I think of who hasn't been through a scandal, you know, that I can't say on the podcast. Oh, uh, oh, uh, it's so probably Tom Petty, uh, Wilco was huge for me. Um, I mean, uh, Radiohead was obviously huge for me. Uh, it was probably huge for everybody listening and everybody who's ever touched a pedal. Um, and, uh, Oh, who else? I'll stick with those three for now. Bruce, you know, Springsteen always classic. And then I'm going to throw a curveball at you. Okay. And I get a lot of hate. For this, but I, I I take the hate because I know I'm right. Uh, but but early early third eye blind was pretty enormous for me in terms of you just guitar. Right. Yeah. Who hates on you for that? Uh, you know, people who don't understand the truth. You know, and uh, and so I think uh, yeah, I, there was some amazing moments that happened on the the debut album and on Blue and and Out of the Vein. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's Steven Jenkins is still on the band, but it's really not the same band, uh, that was doing the albums from, you know, 97 all the way to 2000 and 2003 is when I think out of the vein came out. But, uh, the guys that were tracking the album and writing the songs with Steven at the time were, were pretty ingenious. And so there's some, some really special stuff that, uh, that happened on those albums that shaped my view of guitar and sounds and songwriting and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would have to put them up there for sure. That's a, that's a solid choice. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually forgot how important blue was to me growing up. I, I totally <sighs> forgot until just now. Yeah, it, it's a big album because, you know, it, it's one of those albums that hits like it, it checks a lot of boxes. Like so the songwriting, for the most part, the songwriting is is really great. The instrumentation is, you know, at, on a scale from one to ten, I mean, is like an eight out of ten, you know, and the tones on that album are an eight out of ten. So like every great band and every great album to me kind of has to check up these boxes of lyrics, songwriting, tones uh uh you know technical proficiency and creativity but uh you know and and it checks a lot of those boxes so and as i'm saying that i'm thinking of dawes and dawes is definitely <laughs> the other band that's for sure in the top five but um but yeah those early third eye blind records really checked a lot of those boxes as well in my opinion and not in a lot of other people's opinion, but I, I always fight the third eye blind war with people. So, well, you don't have to fight it with me. I was Good. not like the biggest third eye blind fan ever. Um, I kind of, you know, took an immediate dive. Basically there was a brief period of time where I was transitioning from basically only being exposed to country music. Uh, yeah, you know, mostly the good old stuff and like some '90s country was like primarily what my early childhood was. And then as I started uh, to branch out and find kind of my own thing, like Third Eye Blind was one that I found really quickly, and some of like a little bit more like mainstream, uh, you know, I guess pop rock type stuff. And yeah. then I, t I took a really hard dive after that when I found punk. And so it was like I was like, oh, look at this rock stuff is pretty cool, and I was like what are these crazy people doing over here? This is my yelling, screaming and jumping around. Oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. And so I, I, yeah. I immediately, I went from a uh, very mellow country music to extremely aggressive rock <laughs> in a very short time span. That's and my such a good, were, that's such a good so sure. jump. Oh my God. Yeah. So uh, I guess two follow-up questions. So what was the, 
what was the early, what was the nineties country you're listening to? Cause you know, like we're from Oklahoma, we're here. And so country has a pretty huge part in our, in our culture here still. And, and we don't shy away from it. There's some really great country that has been, that is now and will be later. So, but what oh, were you listening to in the nineties? Yeah, I still love country. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I just don't like it in its current form on most, you know, most country, quote unquote, country radio now really disgusts well, me. Yeah, but, it's the 80-20 rule. Like 20% of it's pretty great uh, on pop radio and then the 80% of it's complete trash, you know? So I don't even know if I can be that generous, but... Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking about that. And I was like, yeah, maybe for country and some other genres, it might be 595 i don't know <laughs> yeah i think you're there i think that's a lot closer so it's you're like, listening you're probably listening to garth of course yeah of course and, definitely listen to garth you're rocking the brooks and dunn especially the neon moon album that was pretty big who doesn't like that song dude neon it still comes awesome. on Love it neon still moon. comes on in the shop here like whenever you know it's just it's part of everyone's story even some of it, everybody here in the shop and so we have a big you know do you call it a PA system? A stereo system like that you can hear in the whole place. And and Neon Moon still comes on sometimes. Somebody puts it on when they're in the right mood, and it puts everybody else in the right mood too. It does. Oh, I, so. I'll tell you, I'm going to uh, – I, I, one of these days, you, you know, maybe, maybe people on the internet will catch a glimpse of me wearing this shirt. I have a really wonderful uh, Brooks and Dunn T-shirt. That is from a tour they did in, I believe, 92 or 93 called Stampede. And it's completely covered in lightning bolts. It's really amazing. Man, I uh, I, I would like a photo of that. And uh, maybe if I like the photo, I might like to buy the shirt from you. I don't know. The shirt, is not awesome. for sale. the shirt is not for sale. But I, okay. uh, I, I will get you a photo of said shirt. Yeah. And, uh, you're you're yeah. listening to some Garth Brooks, too. Of course, sure. Gar- definitely Garth Brooks. Uh, still like Garth to this day. Would like to catch him. Uh, you know, of course, like we said, Brooks and Dunn. Colin Ray was a, a, a big one. Um, yeah. You know, I'm trying to think of some of the other 90s classic. Well, I mean, Alan Jackson, let's be honest. Oh, let's come be on, honest. man. Speak to my yeah. soul. So good. Yeah. You know, Garth um, Brooks lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma for a, a stint. Uh, he's from Yukon, uh, Oklahoma, but he lived in Stillwater where I grew up, which is about an hour north of here, of Oklahoma City. And uh, they have painted on the front of the house. It's on Duck Street in Stillwater. And it's it's painted right above the porch. It says, it, Garth Brooks and Sandy lived here. And it has like a... Like, 1980 through 1981, you know, painted on the on the front of the house. Wow. So, yeah. So he's. I mean, he did. A, go ahead. He's an icon. Let's be honest. If if that was if Garth Brooks had lived in my house, I can't say that I wouldn't do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, he's a musical icon. He's not just a country icon. I mean, you know, he was an innovator in live performance and entertainment and. Just like, just like popular pop star persona, you know, it was out of left field. So, yeah, and if much you love follow for him Garth. on. Oh yeah, definitely. And if you follow him on Instagram, it's just a real treat. It's a Garth Brooks's Instagram is exactly what you would expect Garth Brooks's Instagram to be. It's I wonderful. am pulling it up. I don't follow him. I really need to follow him. Why do I not yeah, follow he, Garth Brooks? Uh, well, he. I don't think he's been on the platform all that long. So. That could, there be, we could go. be something to do with it. It's truly wonderful. He's a treat. He's a treat. You know, I have a friend who sells uh, like heating and air units, like industrial heating and air units uh, uh, here in Oklahoma City to like, you know, like big factories and things like that. So like these huge machines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of his clients uh up and is up in stillwater and he used to play bass for garth brooks but now he kind of runs this warehouse um and so my friend and this guy were out to for drinks um you know you know doing business doing business at the bar down in stillwater probably like at eskimo joe's or the the you know willies or something like that uh, <laughs> and uh and so my friend is like so you used to play for garth brooks like what happened 
you know, like, why did, like, why didn't you go do that? And he's like, man, it's a sad story, my friend. He's like, so us and Garth, we were, we were playing a lot of shows and, you know, we weren't making any money and it was getting tiresome, you know, and I was just getting fed up with, with his, like the big dreams and, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to be huge. And he said, it was just a lot of time for not a lot of money. And it was just a, it was a really frustrating couple of years, you know, for him playing with Garth. And so there's one night, um, where Garth got a call, um, to, uh, to audition for a record label in Nashville. And, and so, he uh he garth goes to the bass player's house and and knocks on his door and opens the door and it's garth and garth is like randy we got a call to go audition in nashville and uh i want you to come with me and play bass and he told garth he's like you know what buddy you better buy a you better buy a round trip ticket because you're going nowhere and he slammed the door. He slammed the door in his face, and that was the last time he saw Garth Brooks. And uh, and now he's uh, yeah, now he's my buddy's client. That is insane. I know, right? That is insane. And because, like, like of all people to 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 have like have had that experience, you know what I mean? Like, not only was he very incorrect, which he couldn't have known at the time. I understand. But like he was so wrong because Garth became literally the biggest music act, musical act in the nineties, the largest like of all time. Sells more records than anybody. He's the king, man. Like that's his. And but so again, you know, he was right. He said he had these pie in the sky dreams, and and uh, he made them come true. <laughs> he made them happen. So yeah, he didn't play bass for Garth after that. Yeah, so, I don't imagine so. I'm, and that, yeah. you know, who knows? Maybe that was like the thing that Garth needed to be like, I'm going to show this guy. I'm going to show maybe him what's up. Yeah, you know? I mean, maybe it maybe Garth would have never happened had he not stood up to Garth. Yeah, that's a good point. Man, there's so many universes that are potential, you know, that are potentialists that have potential. However, you say that. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you. I'm not sure what you what get it. More for- you yeah, get I it. Get it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, the different, uh, man, I better not open this box up, you know. We but, uh, you know, we we'll be up. just, we'll, uh, it's fresh because we just started talking about in the shop, like we were all in my office the other day talking about the fourth dimension and then the fifth dimension and then the sixth dimension and like all these other theoretical dimensions. And then one of the other dimensions is like same start scenario, but. Uh, but other possibilities and other choices that you make. And so different like multiverses based on decisions with same start scenario. But anyway, it, this conversation reminded me of that conversation. So yeah, but we should totally not get into that today. That's like way too much. I don't know. It might be just Um, right, man. I need a cup of coffee if we're going to do that. (laughs) <laughs> um well, well i don't i don't want to get too far away from the 90s country thing i mean we can get way far from it eventually but i i i would be remiss if i didn't bring up a, a couple more artists that were near and dear to my heart um, bring it up and and then i have a story about one of them one one of them being uh clint black like, like let's, let's yeah get dude clint black rules like Dude, rule. you really, yeah, you. This is really your thing. I mean, you really got into it. You're naming all the right people. Of course, Clint Black, uh, incredible. Um, another, another favorite, Vince Gill. Love Vince oh, Gill. Stop, dude. Oh, he's the best. I love Vince. Vince is amazing. Amazing player. I actually got to see him play with his band, the the Time Jumpers, in Nashville, and uh, my face just got about just about got shredded off. It was just crazy the amount of talent those guys have man he's um, such a yeah he's such a gifted player smooth hand super patient and tasteful and the just that sweet high falsetto that he's got going on and whoo i mean it'll just he'll sing you he'll sing you straight into hypnotism it's, oh yes definitely um another another one and this one is what this one actually is kind of related to gear in in a way another one i really like is is tracy bird yeah, uh, he's classic, you know, Tracy Bird songs. 
just yeah. so happens my my grandpa does leather work and uh, makes holsters and guitar straps and stuff really yeah. really fancy nice stuff he's i've got lots of guitar straps he made That's and cool. not so long ago somebody hit him up on his etsy page and was like hey can you make a guitar strap for my i think it was for his brother sure what what who's your brother Tracy Bird was the brother. So my grandpa made a guitar strap for Tracy Bird, and he's been Man. he used, he replaced his old faithful that he's had forever with this new one that my grandpa made, and I think it's the coolest thing ever. That is that is awesome, and even more awesome that Tracy Bird shops on Etsy. Well, his brother does. I don't know if he does. Oh, but... okay. <laughs> that's still that's great, and even cooler that your grandpa's on Etsy. That's awesome. Yeah, grandma kind of runs that for him and he he just uh, makes makes leather stuff and he questions whether it's good and then I look at it and I'm like this is literally amazing. Like like he's really an artist with it. It's it's pretty incredible. That's I, awesome. Uh, I love it. Did you ever try to get in get into it? Did you make any of those cool leather bracelets that were cool in the early 2000s? No, no, never got into the the making of it. I just kind of like it's his thing, you know, uh, yeah. he's, he gets, it's like what he really gets into and he gets into it. He's like, it's kind of a Zen thing. Uh, he just yeah. really, re, he's always enjoyed it. You know, we, he, he would go to, you know, gun shows and stuff. And, and my dad was always amazed. He would just be looking at, uh, looking at leather the whole time, just looking at holsters and designs yeah. of holsters and didn't really care about any of the other stuff. Just, just the leather stuff. It's always intrigued him. And then, I don't know. You know, he hasn't been doing it that long. Maybe, maybe seven, eight years is all he's been really doing it. Even though he's had a, clearly like a lifelong interest in it, and yeah, he just makes and, makes guitar straps. And he found inspiration from like going to gun shows and things like that, or uh, with like the holsters and the straps and belts and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's really always been into like Western stuff. You know, he's 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 a uh, he's he really likes western movies and things yeah. that take place you know in that in that era he's he's been always been a big fan and therefore so am i of course yeah like, and uh so yeah he, he just always draw drawn a lot of inspiration from from that stuff it's it's just interesting it's cool to like see him be able to do something he's really passionate about and has been for a long time and just and like people are receptive to it which is i think shocks him more than it shocks me because the, the, the stuff is really good. And is he from Oregon? He is. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's about well, I don't know, 15 minute drive from my house. So we're close. I gotcha. So cow, cowboys in Oregon. That could be a, a book. Couldn't it be a Netflix well, series? It could be. An, it could be. There's definitely cowboys in Oregon. We, uh, I, I pretended to be one, uh, you know, off and on throughout my young life. I've, I've, I've tackled a steer or two in my day, you know? Yeah. So, so is know. Oregon kind of like, do they, does it have like dualistic identities kind of like where, you know, more closer to the coast, there's probably more of the progressive uh, culture and things that might be associated with Portland. And then kind of, as you get more inland, it gets a little bit more, uh, you know, traditional and reserved and, and, and things like that. Is that kind of how it is with it's definitely has a duality going on there for sure. Like 100%, but it's more, it's not so much coastal. It's more Portland centric. So like Portland gotcha. is kind, okay. kind of, yeah. In the, it's, it's in the upper, it's like in the middle, but it's kind of in the, uh, it's in the Northern part of the state. And as you get further away from Portland in any direction, basically it gets rural in a hurry. Like, yeah, in a big hurry. Like I don't live that far from Portland and, uh, it's pretty, it gets pretty rural. Once you get, basically once you get past my house, you go yeah. like five minutes past my house and you're in farmland. Like, so there's definitely a, a and that's the other thing. Portland isn't as large as what everyone thinks it is. It's, it's a right. fairly small city compared to other places. And, and so it feels like Portland kind of is the state's identity when the bulk of the state is definitely not that way. Yeah, it, that makes sense. It's kind of like Austin being stuck in, in the middle of Texas or 
And Col- you know, Colorado's the same. I have a ton of family in Colorado, and um, and and really, you, you have this perception of Colorado of like you know, like cool, awesome ski mountain people. But really, there's like a lot of uh, uh, what's the uh, I call it Colorado redneck. Can I say that on the podcast? I don't know. You why know? You can. Okay, so like, there's there's like Colorado cool, and then Colorado redneck, and then. So there's like two, I like two types of people in Colorado and everybody listening in Colorado is either like, yeah, I know what he's talking about, or I'm super offended. And so if you're offended, I'm sorry, but if you know what I'm talking about, (laughs) I mean, right. Uh, And so, yeah, it's just, it's so interesting every time you go there because, you know, you run into both sets of people wherever you are, but yeah. How interesting. How interesting. How very, very interesting. Well, hey, let me slide into the, the Facebook group. I uh, asked a question in there yesterday, told people you were coming on, and, and most people said a bunch of nonsense, but a couple of people had some real questions. And uh, uh, sorry, all of you guys that said nonsense, but uh, it's true. You know what you've done. You know. Um, <laughs> you should be ashamed. You should no, don't be ashamed. be ashamed. I like you should not. You should not be ashamed. You should not be ashamed. No. This whole there podcast. you go been nonsense for the most part which is great so uh let's scroll through here oh here we go this is a good one uh david lucas has a good a really good question and dave i want to know this as well you got you got really nice graphics like walrus audio you know every every gearhead knows walrus audio pedals have rad graphics that's just a universal truth well thanks And, uh, and i'm making this question way longer than what he did but it's it's true um, he wants to know, David Lucas wants to know what are your favorite ones though? Which are my favorite. So we kind of, when we design graphics, we kind of go by a rule of thumb where if it's like a smaller enclosure, we try to go for an icon. And then if it's a larger enclosure, we try to go for a scene. Um, and so probably, uh, my favorite, uh, larger pedal would have been, uh, maybe the bellwether um, where, where we told the artist, his name's Nathan price on that specific pedal uh, who plays drums in a band called Broncho uh, who's from here in Oklahoma. And if you don't listen to Broncho, you should um, they're incredible. Um, but Nathan price, he did that one and he handed, I kind of was talking about what we wanted for the bellwether and he handed back this tower Um that you see featured in the middle of the bellwether analog delay. And then he had um, kind of this weird government building to the side. And so really my response was, was I want to, I want to make this scene and I want the, I want the government building to, to be on fire. And then I want there to be like this crowd of people looking and watching the fire. And so uh, so you have all those things happening in the bellwether with this, this kind of like government building burning down and this weird intricate, uh, looks like a spiritual tower in the middle and then this horde of people watching. And, and so that's, that's really the, when we try to create a scene, we try to just create this mystery of like, what is going on here? You know, kind of how, uh, you know, like another one like that is kind of like the descent, how it's kind of in this cave, this cavern, with these guys recovering uh, this skeleton. But then in the back, behind everybody on the descent, you have this one guy uh, in the background standing there. Uh, and you don't, it looks like he's walking in for the first time and they don't know he's there. And it just kind of like makes the hair on your neck stand up a little bit. It's like, well, what is he doing? Um, so those are probably some of my favorites. Uh, but some of the smaller enclosures, I really just, I love the iron horse. It's just, it looks super rock and roll and just like a raging black horse. Uh, and, uh, I, I really like the, the new Lillian, the way the Lillian phaser came out. Um, that's probably one of my favorites as well. So yeah, man, those four is four answers. Okay. That's fine with me. I would Good. say I would I would have actually it's funny. I would have I would have I would have called out the same for I might have swapped the Lillian for the Julia. Yeah, I and, like the Julia a lot. 
specifically, and I specifically remember the half skull face Julia. Yes. The limited one. That yes. is one of the coolest looking pedals ever. That ever. was it yeah, that was a fun one. That was a fun one to kind of go back and forth uh about and yeah, it's 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 very uh it's very provoking. It's very shocking. So Yes. I like it quite a bit. Yeah, man. It's a lot of fun to do that stuff. That part of it. Were you guys surprised at all at how how much demand or interest there are? there is in the custom graphic versions you guys have done. It seems like there's a crazy amount of, of demand for those. And, you know, even to the degree where the used market is seeing, you know, some pretty big, pretty big flips on the limited edition stuff. Are you, was that surprising at all? Uh, it, it, yes and no. I mean, you, you know, we kind of treat it like how a brewery treats like, you know, batches like custom one-off batches of uh, a certain brew or, uh, a certain label and, and, and there's always like demand for some of that limited exclusive stuff. And so, um, we went, we went pretty heavy into it in 2016, uh, and at the, probably the first of 2017. And then, uh, it, it, so we did a lot of them just on a lot of pedals. And then, um, and it, I think we just kind of got tired of, we just, we were like, man, this is taking up a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> to do it and so we we really just reserve the custom stuff now for for black friday and uh and and and, and special events and things like that and there's a couple of our dealers that have some some exclusive art just for their stores but but yeah and, and so the demand uh i'm always surprised when somebody pays more than a new price for something but but you know to each his own and that's great and you do you, man. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you on that for sure. So, oh, in, in kind of the same kind of the same vein, uh, what is the, your favorite pedal that Walrus makes? Uh, I've man, I really love the three eighty five. It's my favorite. Um, it's uh, you know, it's not like it's not the top mover uh, by any means at Walrus. You know, um. But everybody who we send one to and everybody who plays one just comes back changed, you know? I think it's a I think it's a special uh overdrive. Um and it it was inspired really after we saw a Dawes show, you know, and they were playing out of these weird looking film projectors plugged into cabs and it we're like what in the world is going on and so dug in a little bit and found out about like the projector amp and how people are using these old bell and howl It's called the it's a company called bell and howl and they made a, a film projector called the 385 filmo sound and uh how people are taking the audio section that i mean used people used to play movies on these film projectors and then uh, they would plug the audio out of that, out of the amp on the film projector into like a cabinet, but it had a built-in speaker too. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we've since retired those because of technology advancement, but people are buying these old film projectors and, and using the audio section as like a guitar amp. And, I mean, it's really set up the same way as a guitar amp. And so it gets some really unique sounds and some really interesting uh, responses to your dynamics. And so through that, we started tinkering around uh, with some, with some circuits like pedal interpretation of the amplifier and, uh, and yeah, out came the 385. And so just the way it responds to your playing and, um, is uh is really special and so um it's my i always play with it wherever i play and i always have since it came out and it's probably my favorite it's probably my favorite one because you can always find new there's always new dials no ways to put the dials with different guitars and, and find new sounds and new spaces in it uh yeah 385 man overdrive it's my favorite Interesting. You, I've always been curious in that. And when that came out, it was really interesting because I remember when I was researching, you know, vacuum tube amps back in the day. So before I had, I knew I needed a tube amp. 
you know, I, I'd experienced like playing in orange, tiny terror. And I was like, this sounds so much better than, than yeah. my stuff. I need a tube amp. And like, this is just kind of how I am. When I get into something, I research and research and research and research when I'm really into it, you know? And yeah. so before like making a decision and one of the, the like first things I saw, and I wish I could remember the name of the company. It's been several years ago was a company doing those conversions uh, exactly what you're talking about, making these Bell and Hal projectors into amps. And I just thought they sounded really great. And because of them like recycling a lot of components, that the, they weren't that expensive. And so I was like, ah, that's what I'm going to get. Ended up getting sidetracked by Benson amps. And that's been a yeah. nonstop, uh, nonstop love affair of mine, as everyone is definitely aware. And uh, I kind of forgot about the projector amps until the 385 came out. And I, I'm, you just rekindled my, my interest in that pedal. I need to, I need to try one. Um, there's, there, I'm like, ah, I think I'm missing something. I'm missing something in the tone arsenal. Like, I can't, can't have that. You got to try one, man. If only you knew somebody who had one, maybe you guys could figure something out. So. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to find, try to talk to somebody at the company. At some point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Out know. of that whole process, we got to meet like Austin Hooks uh, out in LA, who's one of the guys who uh, kind of brought about the resurgence of that whole project and mod uh, and started offering it to guys like Dawes and then a huge guitar player in Los Angeles, Mason Stoops and the Rolling Stones and uh, a couple of other huge people. But I mean, it's a, it's a really cool project. It's a really cool mod. Uh, it's a really cool pedal. It's just, it's a really neat sound in a world that has a lot of tube screamers. So nice. Yeah. Nice. So I have to tell you, I have to tell you something and I know you already know this. We we've texted about it a couple of years ago, briefly or a year and a half ago, whenever it was, uh, how I was extremely jealous of a particular songs of the shop. And that was that what for everyone who's listening, who doesn't know, Walrus does a video series called Songs at the Shop where they have artists come, come by and jam and they film it. And you had, you had some of my favorite people, my favorite artists there. You, you had, you had thrice in. Yes. And was that as insane as I imagined it to be? It was, yeah, it was really a special day, you know? So we do some of those. Um, and, and you, it's really uh, entertaining and exciting. And you're like, this is so cool. This is like, this is a fun day at work. You know, we got a rock and roll band in here and they're doing their thing <laughs> and it's so fun, you know, but some of them, you know, some of them turn from exciting and fun into really like soul capturing and, and really moving, uh, you know, as you're standing there, listening to one of you know one of your favorite bands play a song that they play for you know hundreds and thousands of people every single night and they're playing in this stupid you know dark shop for 12 people and and there's something you know uh that's really uh there's something that's really moving and captivating about some of those moments and really the thrice one uh was one of those times and it was on a saturday and the whole band didn't come out. It was just uh, Dustin and Tepe, and and I, I was late. Um, I was training for a half marathon, and I had to run that afternoon. And so I came like in my, I came like in my running clothes, kind of after I was like still sweating, and but I really wanted to see Thrice, but I really had to train. Uh, I had to get a run in, and so I just remember being like nasty and sweaty, and like meeting Dustin for the first time. Uh, and I was probably like, man, could this guy like not take a shower before he comes? And the <laughs> answer, they, I mean, the answer was no, I really couldn't, uh, because if I showered, then I would have missed the first song. Uh, and so I'm glad I didn't take a shower. Um, but I showed up and, uh, I took my son with me that day and, um, yeah. And they played, uh, I think they played hurricane and, um, just use they they used our guitars and our pedals and our amps. I mean, they just like showed up and and played through the song, and uh, and yeah, it went, it was a really exciting kind of moving transcendent experience, you know. Uh, and it was super nice of them 
to, you know, I don't know if you ever, you know, toured. I mean, there's not like a lot of energy left um, when you're playing and you're traveling and all that kind of stuff. So for someone to like leave the venue or leave the bus or the hotel to, to come out and spend time uh, at a shop and record a song, you know, you don't take it for granted. And so, um, yeah, it was just a really cool day, really great song, really great band, you know, guys that are really good dudes, um, you know, from when they're off stage and cool to talk to. And they were so nice to us. And, you know, we kind of poked around the shop for an hour or so after that, they played a couple of pedals that were in development and gave their thoughts and, and things like that. And yeah, we've been, we've been friends ever since. So it was an awesome day, dude. You should have been there. I, 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 as soon as you posted something, I was like, stupid Oregon. Why am I in Oregon? Right. <laughs> right. Oh, like, um, but you know, I, I've talked about them a lot on this show. They're my favorite band. So, you know, no big deal or anything. I wasn't jealous at all. It was just fine. Um, but yeah, I, th- I thought that was really cool. And the performance was really good. Shocking, I know. Oh, they had a yeah, another great performance by Thrice. Everyone's so surprised that I'm saying that, but yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was really cool, and I just wanted to touch on it. So it was nice to hear the the full story. Yeah, they're one of those bands that that they check the boxes too. Great songs, fantastic tones, uh, technical proficiency is always there. Uh, creativity, like out of the box stuff, especially with staying in the kind of their genre. Uh, they're able to still think out of the box and and do new surprising things where it's not always predictable, which I think is really hard. Um, I mean, they do a great job of that. So, yeah, man, they're awesome. Yeah, love them, love them. All right, we're getting down to the the wire here, and I've got a couple more questions for you. Yeah, cool. One of one of which, uh, uh, yes, Jason, I'm going to do it this time. Jason uh, Jason Fuzzmonger is a big. Uh, he listens to all the episodes and he's a, a mod in the Facebook group and just a overall huge help with all things tone mob. Uh, but he's been pushing me to put this into the regular rotation and I, I forget half the time, but this time I remembered what is your favorite boss pedal? Um, favorite boss pedal. I, mean, I just, just like to, let me flip my chair around. Uh, there's a few of them I really love. Uh, I think, you know, one that we don't talk about. Let me grab it real quick. All right. It's this one. That one. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I really, I have this one, the Super Shifter PS5. And oh. It is special. Um. I, I don't have it on my board, uh, but like when I go into the studio and if I do stuff for, you know, random people, I always bring it. Uh, it's just like a, it's a harmonist pitch pedal. Um, and, uh, yeah, has a lot of quirks and a lot of really exciting things that it can do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I really love it and I use it a lot. Um, and then I think, uh, people are going to hate this answer, but I really love the HM2, the heavy metal, heavy metal two pedal from boss. Um, holding it here. Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, like in a world that, that where people are addicted to, uh, the textures of the tube screamer and the clon and variations of those two things, I think, you know, it's really special when you can find an overdrive that, that responds in a new way and provokes maybe a different emotion uh, and things like that. But I, uh, the HM2 is a really fantastic uh, distorter, and um, there's just there's different unique texture in there, and uh, the response is is rowdy and robust and and uh, and emotional, and and man, I, I really love it and. Walrus actually designed the red, uh, the red heavy overdrive. I can't remember what we called it, distortion or something like that. Uh, but uh, we designed the red after the heavy metal with a couple of tweaks that 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 we liked about the heavy metal and maybe some things we didn't like. Uh, 
but yeah, that was, that was the Walrus Audio Red. Um, but yeah, it's also one of my favorite boss pedals. And then, uh, but the, I think it was the, I think it was the DD five. That was my first delay pedal to play, which, you know, there's been, you know, DDs before that. Um, and then after that, but, uh, it was the five that, that I first got to play where I first played a delay pedal and, uh, and man, it's, it's just, you know, like your first time to play a delay pedal is like, is like a bookmark in everyone's guitar experience, you know, where you're just like, Oh, this, there's things happening after I play and I sound huge. I sound big. And, you know, it just really opens up your world to like a, a whole new thing. It's like going to college for the first time. You're like, I'm in a dorm room all by myself with a guy I don't know. And, uh, like a <laughs> delay, like a, a, your first time to play a delay pedal is kind of like that. You're like, wow, there's a new thing and it's doing things that I don't understand, but it's so fantastic. And, and so, yeah, I mean, any, any delay from boss has been fantastic from the DM stuff to the DD stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, all those pedals have a, a special place in my heart. You're 100% right. I never really thought about it that way, but it, the first time you play a delay and a reverb, especially, I think, and especially in conjunction with each other, it, it totally changes everything. You're like, Whoa, I didn't know my guitar could sound like that. Listen to that. That is a, that is really something that is something special. Yeah. I should be a professional. I That's what I this. should do. Yeah. Yeah. If they only I'm, could hear what I'm doing right now. I'm going to be the next big thing. And it's all because of this DD5. Thanks, DD5. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a special time. Those are great pedals, man. Boss is like, you know, Boss is, they've been, they've been doing some great stuff for a really long time. So They're, uh, they're the boss, one might say. Yeah, they are. That was a dad joke. That was very much a dad joke. (laughs) Sorry about it. So, last question. This one was really, really important. I know you're sitting down. Um, Unless you you got up. I don't think you probably did, though. I'm sitting. I'm sitting. This could determine the future of the company. So, Okay, I'm ready. No big deal. What kind of pizza do you like, Cole? Uh, Man. So, uh, I mean, I like, I like almost anything, um, but probably my favorite pizza and no one's going to know what this is cause they're not in Oklahoma city, but there's a, there's a pizza shop downtown called Hall's pizza kitchen and they have a pizza called beat the heat and it has, uh, pepperonis, uh, jalapenos, sriracha, feta cheese on it and it, it's a mouth burner you know and so that's probably my favorite pizza you know and pizza is like music you know so if you're if you're going for like pretentious like oh who is your favorite artist you know you have to say you know, <laughs> well i prefer the work of wc it's like well i prefer rock Monanoff, you know it's like okay well well who's your favorite songwriter you know uh, that's a totally different question. So, I mean, you know, who's my favorite delivery pizza? Uh, you know, I've always been, a f- we've got one here in town called Marcos and, uh, Marcos pizza. It's just basic pizza and it's fine and it's good and it's good for the family. Uh, it does the job. Yeah. yeah, it does the job. So, I mean, there's so many sub genres of of pizza, you know, there's, you get into Chicago pizza and start dipping into the Geno's thing. And, uh, yeah, man, I mean, there's so many, so many directions you could take pizza, but beat the heat at Hall's pizza kitchen in Oklahoma city. That's for sure. My favorite pizza. All right. That's a good answer. That was very solid, very sure of yourself. And, uh, I really, I like it. I like that. my man, I like that. It should be everyone's favorite pizza. I haven't I can't go that far. Sure. I can't go that far. I can't go that far. Yeah. You're I overstepped. I have really overstepped. I just want to apologize to everybody. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just you really you really took it too far there. Just I trying to bring my soul here. 
We're going to have to get rid of, we're going to have to cut that out. I don't want anybody to think ill of you. <laughs> uh, well, what about you? What's your favorite pizza? Well, whoa, you just thrown this back at me all of a sudden. So I don't know about my favorite. Uh, that one's really hard because, you know, I like different kinds of pizza for different moods, right? Totally. Um, but I did just have one today that I thought was fantastic. And it was just because I happened to be running some errands up in this neck of the woods. And then, you know, I wouldn't have stopped if I would have known what ended up happening, which is I ended up being late for this podcast. But don't (laughs) tell anybody. Uh, I ran into some traffic. But I I had a pizza from a place called uh, The Life of Pie up here in Portland. Ah. And I had their seasonal mushroom pizza with sausage. I, I added some sausage to it. I, I got to have my meat. And it's mm-hmm. one of the best things I've had in a long time. That was really, really awesome. It's like a Man. wood-fired Italian-style place. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, they use a little truffle oil on there and just all these seasonal wild mushrooms, which, you know, if you don't like mushrooms, you're not going to like this because it really leans into the, the shrooms. But, uh, yeah. man. It was it was delightful. So that's my favorite pizza that I've ate today by a long sounds, shot. Mm, that sounds so good. Pizza's so great. Why are we not having pizza right now? <sighs> that's the point. real question. We should have been chowing down and while we were doing this podcast because that's just what everyone wants to hear is smack. Yeah, I want to hear a bunch of dudes smack on pizza. You know, I I made a point. You know, like you know, between eighteen and twenty two is 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 when you're the smartest in your life. Okay. Uh, All right. Sure. And, uh, that's said very sarcastically for anybody listening. Uh, but it's when, you know, it's when you start declaring truths, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I, I remember a bunch of my dudes we were talking one night and, uh, and I said, you know what? Like when everyone's asked their favorite food, if they say anything that's not pizza, they're lying. And everybody, we all like, we thought about it and we were like, dude, I think you're right. Like that, like that, that should, and probably is everyone's favorite food. But instead they say something like oysters or, you know, ribeye and things like that, which are really great things to eat. But like, like, I mean, everyone's favorite food is probably pizza. I I am inclined to agree. Obviously, it's a staple of the show. It's a it, it, we've kind of built the whole culture around it, as far as the podcast is concerned, and uh, and that that sort of happened by accident because you know I had the same kind of thought process. I was interviewing, and if you guys want to know where this all started, for any new listeners, I was interviewing a builder named Jason Banning, and yep. I kind of ran out of things to talk to talk about. Like I was new to podcasting. I, I wasn't. I had, I had. I had ran through my list of prepared questions, and I just wasn't sure where where to go. But I didn't want to stop the flow, so I asked him about pizza, and so it was kind of like this towards the end of the episode, and and it just slowly became a thing. It just uh, and at the end of every episode, I got to talk about pizza. My it's wife happened. So she yes. There's a. All, I say all that to say pizza is near and dear to my heart. I care very much about it. I, again, kind of nerd out on it a little bit, as I tend to do with things. But my wife says to me the other day, she says, you know, I understand that pizza is kind of a thing with your show and, and all that. She's like, but I feel like you're not being honest with everyone. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? And she says, your first love, your first food love, as, as I know you, was burgers. It's like Mm. when we first got married, everywhere we went, you were ordering a burger. And it's true. I do eat a lot of burgers and I do love burgers a lot. And if you had to make me choose between delicious, delicious cheeseburgers and pizza, I don't know if I can make that decision. I I just don't know if I could choose that. Well, So here's the thing about burgers, though. Is so with pizza, like I, I'm pretty adamant, and people can disagree with me, but I'm pretty sure they'd be wrong. But there really isn't like bad pizza, you know. Uh, so there's like different genres of pizzas. There's different types. That's from different places. There's different temperatures. There's different thicknesses. There's different quality of ingredients. But like I've never had pizza 
I don't, I can't remember any time in my life where I've ever had pizza, unless it's been rotten, where I've said, oh, that's bad pizza. I'm not going to finish that. But there have been plenty of times where I've gotten a burger and thought, oh, that's a bad burger. Oh, this is bad meat. This They didn't cook this well. It's, man, the bun is nasty. Or, you know, like there's plenty of, there's there's a lot more margin for error in a hamburger than there is for pizza. You know, pizza is like sci-fi. Like there's no bad sci-fi. It's just all different sci-fi, you know? And so uh, I think I think you'd be safe to go with pizza every single time. You know, like there's not really a pizza available to us as human beings that that is bad, you know? And, and people can disagree with me and you can disagree with me, but but I mean, I'm, I'm going to stand by that. I will kind of disagree with you. I will, okay. I will, I will okay. say this, I, and only from personal experience, only. Uh, you are right in, in many aspects. You are right in that most pizza is tasty. Um, and, and I've definitely had more bad hamburgers and cheeseburgers in my life than I have pizza. And as far as when I say yep. bad, I mean like, I get it and I'm like, ooh, I'd rather not eat this. Like I'd yeah. rather I'm soup I'm hungry and I would rather pass on this when I say bad. Um I only had that happen once or twice with pizza, but I have had it happen. I definitely yeah. have it happen. I went I would super rather not be eating this pizza right now because it's that bad. In fact, it was so bad that when I started, I I've, I've told people about this before. It's a particular place that was the only place that would deliver to my old job. And so as such, sometimes there were, you know, company events or whatever, and they would get pizza and, and, and everyone would kind of say, this pizza is not very good. Why are we getting it? And like, I would, I got to the point where I was literally just scraping off the toppings (laughs) and eating the toppings because the crust is so bad, like really, really genuinely bad tasting. I was like, what is wrong with this crust? It's broken. This pizza is broken. It's done wrong. I don't understand. So, man, yeah. I feel like there's an isn't there an office episode about that? I feel like there. I think I just watched it the other day. I don't know, yeah. but I just remember every time I think of of the office and pizza, I just think of him walking around, Michael Scott walking around New York City and going, "Ah, got to go to my favorite New York slice." Spot. <laughs> yeah, as far as baby, as bar. <laughs> while you're here you got to do it <laughs> yep <laughs> oh, oh man that so funny so great that is so great well this has uh, been awesome man thank you so much for coming on yeah absolutely thanks for thinking of me thanks for having me i appreciate it dude do you have anything else you want to tell the people before we sign off uh no i mean i think uh one if you're listening thanks so much and if you've ever played a walrus pedal or had one uh, uh we are we're a staff of just really thankful grateful people uh for all everybody out there and so i'm thankful i appreciate you guys and uh yeah we'll do our best to keep good stuff coming out sounds good man all right we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up for colt this is blake and as always folks good luck and good tones All right, we did it. There's another one in the can. I always have such a good time talking to Colt. He is a consistently excellent conversationalist, and we have we have a really good time whenever we chat. So that was really nice to make that happen. And you know, I'm sure you could tell we were both having a good time. So make sure you check out all the stuff that Walrus Audio has to offer and show him some love. And before I sign off, I don't want you to forget to sign up for the Tone Mob newsletter because we're giving away a Solid Gold Effects Zeta Drive this month, and all you have to do is sign up for the newsletter and answer, answer? Answer. answer the trivia question that comes out once a month, so you just stay glued to your inbox. That's going to come in at some point here really soon, since we are nearing the end of the month. So be looking at your inbox for everyone that's signed up. I'm, I'm going to email. I'm going to keep it random. I'm not going to get a set time, because that would be... Too easy. Way, way too easy. So yeah, you just go to ToneMob.com. There's a little tab that says Join the Mob. Click there, put in your email, 
easy peasy. I'm not going to oversaturate you. It'll just be a little once a week blurb about the podcast and anything else that's going on you might need to know about. And then one of those weeks, we'll have the trivia question for the pedal or whatever kind of thing we're giving away that month. Anyway, if you have any questions or you need anything, shoot me an email to info at tonemob.com or hit me up on any of the socials. I'm around as much as I can possibly be. If I don't get to you, don't think I'm ignoring you. I just have not got there yet. So thank you. All right. Talk to you next week. Bye bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.